Hello, and welcome back to The Art of Parenting. This is your host, Jeanne-Marie Penel. And today I have the lovely Jessica Pate to talk about her book that came out in May called Becoming Brave Together. So Jessica, thank you so much for being on The Art of Parenting today. And uh, let's get this conversation going. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. So I always like to start with having my guests define what the art of parenting means to them. I like that. Well, I think when I think of the art of parenting, I think how we definitely had one idea before we began the journey. And then afterward, we definitely probably paint a new picture about what it's all about. And I think, um, you know, art is so subjective, right? And I think parenting methods are too. I mean, I definitely think there are some tried and true, but there's trends. And what works for one child may not work for your next child. And so you really have to learn, you know, the beauty and the complexity of your child in order to be the best parent for them. Mm, Beautiful. Yes. So so true. So true. Thank you for that. And uh, before we get uh, into our conversation, I'd love if you would take a moment to introduce yourself and a little bit about your background and the work that you're doing uh, today. I would love to. I would love to. So I've been married to my husband, Chris, for decades, 27 years. We have three kids. Luke is 23 and he's finishing college. He has one more semester and we have Ryan who is about to be 21. And I say Ryan is the one that made me a caregiver. He was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder called Prader-Willi syndrome when he was five weeks of age. And I have a daughter, Kate, who is 18 and she is out of high school. She's doing an EMT course and working two jobs. Wow. So I'm in the, uh, the adult-ing-ish yes, <laughs> phase yes, of and, parenthood. And, yeah. And maybe, and maybe soon an uh, empty nester as, as I am. So uh, that's a whole other so chapter. Nice. Yeah. How nice. Well, with Ryan, we don't know if we'll ever be an empty nester because he will require 27, 24 seven care. Uh, And we do talk about him someday living separately because we think it's age appropriate and it's just something we would like to do so that we can focus more on being Ryan's parents instead of his daily caregivers. Right, right, right. So tell me a little bit about this organization that you have created. uh, And I'm assuming due to the fact that you gave birth to Ryan and your, your, your life was probably kind of turned upside down and the art of parenting came in because here you became a caregiver uh, for him. So uh, I know that you have a foundation. We are brave together. So t- tell us a little bit about that and, and how people can know more. Thank you. So I say that connection and community saved me. Uh, when we got Ryan's diagnosis, we were so scared. We were anxious. We were so, I mean, our hearts were on the ground. Our jaws were on the ground when you read about it. And we thought, we are so alone in this. This is crazy. I cannot believe that this is our new life. Mm. So thankfully, there was a national organization and a California foundation. We jumped in right away. We went to our first support group when Ryan was a baby and we found people that we bonded with and who are still a part of our life to this day. And we couldn't have navigated this really crazy altered parenting journey without having other people in our life who were ahead of us in the journey, who could, you know, sort of organically mentor us who understood what we were going through, who understood the highs, the lows, the really, really hard days, you know, the small victories that mean everything. And, and, you know, that just continued as Ryan entered the school district. Then we found people there to navigate the school district and state agencies and all of that. So community is everything when you have a crisis or when you have chronic hardship or when you have a chronic illness. It's everything. You have to be surrounded by other people who understand and who can validate 
what you're experiencing. So because of all of that, I started We Are Brave Together in 2017 with the intent to combat the isolation and loneliness and the burnout that caregiving moms face by offering support groups, which we call connection circles. We have them all over the United States. And we also put on low cost retreats. Again, we started with just one in California. Now we offer four in California and four or five outside of California. And then we also have a podcast called Brave Together Podcast. And then we just released our first anthology of caregiving stories. Beautiful. And yes, that was the book I was mentioning, uh, Becoming Brave Together. So thank you for that. And so with this, you know, experience that you have in you yourself being a caregiver, but also be, being surrounded by other, and I'm assuming mostly mothers, because you you tend to use the word mother more than parent or father. So I'm assuming that it's very uh, mother-centric. It is. That's so funny. That's a term we use, mother-centric, mom-centric. It is set up for caregiving moms. Uh, We've definitely, you know, tried to do things for the dads in the past and something that we're venturing into are some social gatherings, which we call couples mingles to get partners or spouses or dads involved in connection and community because they don't really show up to support groups. And so this is a way to really involve dads or partners um, into the community and and to be surrounded as well by other dads or men or partners who get it. So um, we'll definitely expand on that. And so with with all this experience, so with your own personal experience and, and being in community with all these other mothers, what are kind of the 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 most important takeaways that you have from uh, mothers and, and, and their, their needs. I mean, I know you say, you know, this need for community, but are there other things that you kind of hear over and over again of, you know, what ifs, or I wish, or all of that? Well, moms are exhausted and they're overwhelmed and they have way too much on their plate when you're a caregiver and a parent and working and juggling other kids. And maybe some moms in our community have multiple kids with multiple disabilities. It's a lot. And so what we teach is really about preserving and protecting your mental health because we all need that, right? As human beings, as parents, we must invest in our own mental health. And so I feel like I am always giving permission. Yes, You can carve out time for yourself. Yes, you are allowed to. Yes, you deserve this. Yes, you are worthy of this because you have to protect your mind, heart, and body for the long haul of caregiving. So, and and the other things that I definitely hear is just there's not enough services and supports and systems supporting the disability community, the medically complex community, the mental health community. So... So when you say there's not enough programs, it's not for the children themselves, but it's more for the caregivers and the the team surrounding or for the children as well? Well, there's, you know, definitely there's, there's um, a lack in resources for kids, but there's definitely a lot more resources for kids with disabilities than adults with disabilities. Oh, I see. Okay. For sure. For sure. Um, But there's also just a lack of respite caregivers that are available across the country. So in the state of California, for example, if your child qualifies to be a client of the regional center, there are 21 Mm -hmm. regional centers in the state of California, then you can qualify to get respite hours. And not every state has that. So when you say, excuse me, when you say respite hours, that means somebody else coming in to kind of take over so mom can get a break. Okay. So parents can get a break or mom can get a break. Okay. For sure. So there are agencies where they have caregivers. So people Mm -hmm. who, who sign up to be a caregiver and, you know, sometimes you get great people and sometimes you don't. Um, Sometimes you get people that fit, you know, Ryan is a kind of a particular fit. You have to have the right personality to fit with him. Um, We've had great people that we've held on to for five years, eight years, 10 years, because 
They are just so good with Ryan and they have the right heart and they have the right skills. Um, these agencies that are vendored with the state do not hardly pay anything. So they are not drawing the people that are needed. Like we have all these respite hours that have been awarded to us monthly. We're barely using them because there are no workers because they don't get paid enough money. Okay. So there needs to be a movement to honor these wonderful humans that are wanting to do this work and pay them appropriately. Yes. 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 Yep. And so when you say that California has this, you're, you're saying that there's other states that just don't help you at all? No, no respite care? Correct. Not, not every state awards respite hours. Wow. Very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that you would want a mother who maybe has just learned of a hard diagnostic, um, what would you tell her first? And what would be the advice of finding that uh, support and that community right away? Well, I would say that you are not alone and you don't have to do this alone. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it's important to ask for help. So it's really hard to ask for help in our culture. And I think women tend to be the, I mean, statistically, women tend to be the default primary caregiver, um, whether they're working or not. And I think it's easy for moms, and I think especially if you're a stay-at-home mom, to feel like, well, this all falls on me. It should all fall on me. I will handle all of it. You know, there are different reasons for that. Um, but I think it's important to ask your partner, ask your spouse, ask family for help from the beginning. If you don't have any family that lives near you, then I would encourage you to be bold and brave and find other special needs moms where you live and swap favors. Even if it's just an hour or two hours and you swap favors, you train each other how best to work with each other's children and you swap favors because it's really important to step away. I would also say find community and I can certainly help you. Um, you can look in Facebook groups. Uh, you can look online. You can look using hashtags on Instagram. There's lots of ways to find community. And I would say that I know you're tired. I know you're overwhelmed. I know you're exhausted. But when you have our people around you who get it, it's mm. comforting and transforming. <laughs> transformative. Yeah. yeah. And sadly, I would say this is true for any new mother, right? I mean, you don't have to wait to have, you know, a diagnostic that is that is difficult. It's it's true about just that whole postpartum period, just about being a new parent. I mean, we, you know, we, we always talk about the village, like that is a very important aspect of, you know, parenting and community and all of that. So I agree. thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. And so when you, when you um, create these uh, support groups and everything, are these led by uh, mental health uh, workers or therapists to, to help mothers or like what kind of, you know, activities or uh, discussions that you have in these groups? Great question. So we have uh, we have a, a whole process for recruiting or interviewing and vetting new connection circle leaders. Okay. We have a curriculum that we train. We're, we've been very, very intentional from the beginning. Once the request was made, you know, to start a satellite support group somewhere else or a connection circle outside of where we began in the South Bay. So we have a whole curriculum. We also have a team of mentors. So each Connection Circle leader is trained. They're given a training guide. And then they're given a mentor who is a coach who checks on them monthly. Okay. I would say maybe half of our leaders are probably coaches. Okay. Um, as is, I know one of our leaders is a licensed clinical social worker. Um, not because we require it. You do not have to be a coach or a therapist 
to learn how to facilitate a safe, sacred space for moms to share. Okay. We, we train you, we support you, we talk about, you know, troublesome things that can come up. Um, we give you language, we, you know, we, we provide a lot of guidance and training about how to do that. Wonderful. And so these then are really just a place to come and share and, and get support, but are you also offering maybe, you know, agency support of where, where to find certain resources and things like that? Because I know, um, and I had, I'm, I'm, and I apologize, but I was looking over trying to find the name of, um, uh, Kelly Coleman, she wrote a book about yes. parenting. You know her? Oh, yeah. Okay, Because she a was friend. a big, I mean, she's just was a, a you know, lots of energy about mm -hmm. just, you know, ha having these resources and all of that. Yes. So is that the kind of thing that you're also offering in your support group is to just empower these mothers to to know where to find resources, because it right. sounds like it's really difficult. It can be really difficult depending on where you live, uh, depending on what state, depending on if, if you're in a rural area or a city. Uh, it depends on your school district. I mean, there's a lot of factors that weigh into how easy or hard it is to mm -hmm, find the resources mm -hmm. that you need. Um, I would say the primary purpose of our connection circles is to share, to be validated, to be encouraged and supported, and to be you know, we always say that everyone there is a part-time share, encourager, validator, supporter. And naturally, people will ask about resources. I've got to find a therapist for my kid. I've got to find an ABA therapist. I need to find a new psychiatrist. I need to find a new neurologist. And so the Connection Circle Leader will kind of naturally become a hub, or they okay. can certainly come to you know, We Are Brave together and say, do you have any resources for this? Have you heard about any programs in my area and you know we will let them know what we what we hear about we certainly post about resources as we hear about them in our newsletter in our facebook group our private facebook group is really a great place where people can ask questions again the same i'm looking for you know such and such can anyone advise that or i'm looking for a book on this topic you know so right. there's a lot of resource sharing. One thing that we do train our leaders on is that um, our connection circles are for sharing and being validated and not problem solving and fixing. So okay. Okay. we don't want like people jumping on each other. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? You should do this. You should do that. Right. Unless a mom raises their hand and says, I would love to ask a question today. And I welcome your feedback. You can you can say anything. I, I really need some advice on something. So if a mom comes to the group and kind of wait till the latter portion of the meeting for this, um, I you know we definitely welcome that. But we really encourage it to be just a time of sharing and being heard and you know feeling encouraged by just everyone's presence and validation. Wonderful, wonderful. And when when we're not in these support groups, right? So I, I'm assuming these support groups happen once a month, once a week. How how often? We ask our leaders to lead monthly or monthly. every other month. Or every other month. And they can so be the, in person or virtual. Okay. So the rest of the time, mom mom is, you know, home, uh, alone, being a full time caregiver. What are your kind of go to resources to be able to take care of yourself and to, to, you know, make sure that your mental health is uh, being well taken care of uh, physical and all that. It's like, what are kind of your, your go to um, advice that you have for these mothers? Well, I mean, before we give a list of ideas, because we, we, we talk about the difference between self comfort and self care true self-care self-comfort and self-care 
So huh. self, self-comfort self would be getting your nails done, watching Netflix, having a glass of wine, having a piece of dark chocolate. Nothing wrong with those things, but they will not sustain you for the long haul of, of life or caregiving. Um, and so we talk about true self-care, which means you're engaging in practices. It could be a few minutes a day. It could be 30 minutes a day. It could be 30 minutes twice a week, something, you know that helps you access joy or feel grounded or feel centered or access peace, you know, things like meditation, prayer, exercise, movement, uh, journaling, um, dancing in the kitchen, you know, it, it can be, you know, as small as, you know, just a few minutes every single day that you are intentional about taking time for yourself and engaging in practices, like I said, that help you access joy or peace. And and we do have on our website, we call it um, bite-sized self-care suggestions. It's a long list of ideas that okay. a couple of our leaders have put together. And they're all great ideas. They're all, you know, some, some are free. You know, there's a lot of things actually that are very free. And, and I'm always... <coughs> I'm always putting podcast episodes into our newsletters that I think are really helpful. Like, for example, you know, I just heard something on the Mel Robbins podcast about five practices to something about lowering your stress. All free, all doable, very much explained, research backed, science backed, you know, so I'm always sharing things like that as well. But before we give those ideas. And I think I said this earlier on is you have to really believe that you deserve to invest in your own mental health. Otherwise, all the ideas about really great practices that will help your mental health don't matter unless you believe that you deserve a few minutes, 10 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever, a day to invest in your own mental health. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that about, you know, having to go through that process of really believing (laughs) that you deserve it and that you need it and so forth. And I would love like if you could maybe give a pep talk to a mom who is listening, who might be wavering as to Mm -hmm. like, oh, no, I can I can handle this. I'm, I'm okay. Like, what what do you say to that mom? Like, no, you really <laughs> need to believe that this is necessary, right? How, yes. how would you say that? Yeah. That's a great question. I would say that I know that it's possible that it was modeled for you or taught to you, mm. or you see other mothers who are volunteer alcoholics and are serving, serving, serving. And I would say that that does lead to burnout. Mm. And if you go down, your whole family goes down. So, and I know you don't want that because you're a loving mother who is taking care of your family. That if you go down, your whole family goes down. So it's important that you take care of yourself. And it's not selfish. But when we've heard the term self-care, we tend to equate it with selfishness because the Mm. word self is in there. But somebody said, I heard this, quote, you know, good mothers are like candles. They burn themselves out to give others light. No, No. absolutely (laughs) not. Absolutely (laughs) not. You are not the giving tree. You are not cutting down your branches and your trunk to serve others. It's okay to have boundaries. It's okay to protect time for yourself. But (laughs) if you're following the martyr motherhood philosophy, you are going to burn out. You are mm. going to hit a wall. You are going to get resentful and bitter because you've exhausted everything of yourself mm. to serve others and not take care of yourself. I mean, this is coming from someone who has created a nonprofit. I am serving others for a living, right? I'm serving mm-hmm. others, but I'm very protective. I go to yoga three or four times a week, no matter what, unless I'm sick. You know, even though my son doesn't like it, my son does not want anyone else to do his morning routine, even though my husband is great. I still go because I have to. I know that if I don't, 
it's not doing me or anybody else any good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was, that was very, very good. And I think, you know, it's so true for, for so many of us, you know, just as mothers that we, we do tend to be, you know, these, these warriors. I mean, just last night I had two girlfriends over for dinner and, you know, one of them started crying because she was sharing and we were both like boundaries, boundaries, right? And so it's, yeah. it's so, so important to, to be able to just take the, the time, like you do it for your children, you know, mm -hmm. you've got to do it for yourself. So uh, very important. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, anything else that you would like to share uh, before, before we wrap up? I, I know that you probably have, you know, many suggestions or, or ideas, anything else that you want to share? Well, I would love for everyone to read our book, even if you're not a caregiving parent, because it will open your eyes to the disability world, the medically complex world, the mental health world um, that parents are handling when they have kids with various diagnoses. Um, I'm sure probably many people in your audience know one person who has a child with a disability. And I think I think it's easy to minimize how extreme another person's life is until you read many, many stories. And so we've provided 22 stories, wow. moms who represent different diagnoses or their children represent different diagnoses and different ages of kids. And it will be very heart opening, I hope, and eye opening as well. And I think, you know, what I would say too is whether you have somebody in your life who is a parent caregiver, we all have somebody who's going through something hard. We all have friends who go through crisis and loss. And the best thing that you can say to somebody else going through that is, I know enough to know I have no idea what that's like. I have no idea what your journey is like or what your loss is like or what your crisis is like. But I do know that I love you and I care for you mm. and I want to walk through this with you. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. For, for someone who has just gone through a loss of a dear friend, I wish somebody would say that to me. So thank you. That m makes me quite emotional. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, now I I love I always like to wrap up with a more personal question and and kind of back to your your own parenting and you mentioned at the beginning of the show that you have a 23 year old mm -hmm. so if you were to go back 24 uh, years when you were expecting your first child what wise words would you tell yourself knowing all that you know today oh my gosh so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so much. Okay. I, the very first thing that comes to mind is focus more on connection than control. Oh, yes. That's, that's a big one right there. That's such a big one. Thank you for that. Thank You're you for welcome. that. Any, any parting words that you would like to leave our listeners and viewers with today? I just want to say parenting is so hard. Mm. It is so hard. And it, why is it hard? Because we love so fiercely. We want so much for our kids. And there is no one way to parent. There is no easy parenting manual out there that just step one, step two, step three. So I just want to say, I see you and I'm here for you. Mm, thank you. This has been lovely, Jessica. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your brave work. Thank you. Aw, thanks so much. I'm grateful.